What's up YouTube? Today we're going to talk about this idea that the visual arts uh, and music and mathematics are all actually cognitive sciences because they're ways of making sense of the world and differentiating things around us, finding the sameness and the difference, difference in the sameness, that whole thing, uh, associating things. And I'll also recall back to the previous episode where I said that perception, language, and synesthesia are basically the same thing. So I could sort of dive deep into each of those examples, which I might in a, in a separate video, but for today I'm going to give the example uh, of visual arts because it's, it's Art Basel. Um, so, you know, something that's kind of interesting is that, let's say I had a photo of me right next to me. So me here in the flesh and then a photo of me, then maybe a drawing in black and white, um, and then maybe like a cartoon, and then a Picasso of, of me, uh, and then, you know, a Jackson Pollock analog or something like that. Now, if you think about this, the distance between how related those things are it starts to get larger and larger and larger as you, you know, get further apart and more abstract and compressed. Um, and that, that's sort of a good representation of representation itself. Each of these are, are representations to the reference material, in this case me, to the, you know, perspective of the observer, in this case you. So now let's think about this, right? Let's say there's this photo right next to me. The distance between what the observer has to do to even tell the difference between those it's, it's quite minimal, right? I mean, if you have a, a photo of me that's basically on a pretty decent film or digital camera and then you have me next to it, you're actually you're not going to have a hard time finding the differences. You're, you're, it's going to be very easy to find out how similar they are because there's just less work that you have to do to differentiate things, right? And then now let's say you go on to, uh, you know, a drawing of me on canvas or on a piece of paper. It could be hand-drawn, whatever. Uh, that's in black and white though, right? Now, there's still a level of abstraction you have to do to be able to tell the difference between those things, but you can still more or less figure it out. And then if you go a step further, you have maybe a cartoon. And now cartoons are really interesting because um, you can have a cartoon, depending on how it's drawn and proportioned, uh, be almost representative of multiple different versions of yourself. So sort of like you and, and your doppelgangers or clones, and you can all have slight differences in different ways. But because the cartoon is more ambiguous, it has more informational ambiguity, more rooms of, you know, for interpretation, it could apply to multiple different things, right? Um, but it's interesting though, that you can still have this representation of a cartoon and you can even have very visceral emotions and reactions and memories associated with that. And you take that a step further and you have a Picasso. Now Picasso is pretty abstract, even compared to the, you know, traditional say 2D drawing, um, it's quite abstract. And so you'll see that, you know, the face will be proportioned in a different way or rotated in some different way and the colors will be different and you know it's gonna look it's gonna look like uh it's gonna look like you're on drugs almost you know it's gonna it's gonna look like you're dreaming you're on drugs the whole the whole thing is sort of just a little disoriented uh but you can still have some underlying formula that directly derives this original version to and from um and then if you go a step further all the way on the far edge you have you know a jackson pollock painting or something and that painting is so vague, so ambiguous, so compressed, so abstract that it could represent so many different things. And you could say it's almost like some, you know, without having the reference material, you could almost say looking at that, it could be basically an infinite number of things. It would, it would be something you call like a, a combinatorial explosion of, uh, of ways to interpret that and make sense of it and model it because there's just so many different ways things could be combined and weighted and, and you know, partitioned out. And I think this says something really interesting going back to that idea of informational ambiguity that I spoke about in the first episode and the whole thing about language and perception and synesthesia is that all of these, depending on what the agent, the observer, is trained on, right? The way they've compressed time and the way that they're looking at those things, they may interpret these things very differently, right? Now, if you have two different agents that are slightly different and they're looking at maybe a photo of me and then a photo of a photograph or the drawing next to me, like, that's not much of a difference like that, that that's not going to take a lot of work but you know if you make things a little bit more vague and ambiguous by removing details and context which is what we do to even create a cartoon or you know some animated thing anyways um or an exaggeration of caricature or whatever there are by definition more rooms of interpretation because there's a distance between this you know original reference material and this current output this is this is sort of why i say that the visual arts in this case, I say for music and math, but in this case, visual arts, uh, it's a cognitive science, right? This is literally giving you an example of the ways that we perceive things and make sense of information and create our own constraints and limitations to actually differentiate something in the first place, perceptually, right? And then this also brings up the idea about like, a, which, which you'll recall from a previous episode as well, about how I say that 
shapes and text and words and language are represented on our screens or on pieces of paper. For instance, you're looking at me now on a presumably pixelated screen. This thing that you're seeing of me in this background and everything in the perspective of the camera, that is a representation. I'm not literally there. The goal of this is to basically trick your brain into thinking I'm there so that you can interact with it. When you're, when you're uh, doing a Zoom call with somebody or something, like that person is not actually there in front of you. And yet you're, you're arriving at this interface where you sort of act like they are in front of you to a degree, right? Even though like, you know, like this person is not in front of me, but it kind of is functionally speaking. And so if you think about the ways we interact with different types of, of systems, of various amounts of agency, I mean, I, I think that, you know, even something like a, a clock or, or a table or a camera has a level of agency. It's just so far off from the way we think of agency in ourselves, right? And, and, and will to do something. Um, and so it's, it's almost like when you're looking, when you're looking at a language, the language in a sense is also speaking to you. Now you're technically in more control of it and that you can choose how to interpret it, but it's still kind of controlling you in that it's limiting the way you, it can be you know, perceived in certain ways. So for instance, let's just say, um, let's say, you know, let's say this is your first time drawing something. Maybe, um, you know, you're drawing on a piece of paper, you're very young or you're, you've just never drawn before. So you get a pencil, pen, whatever piece of paper, you start sketching and drawing things. Now, without, you know, being explicitly trained on something, the way you're going to draw is, is probably a very good perspective into the way that your, your brain, uh, your, your mind is uh, partitioning its attention um, across that space. And, you know, I, I'm willing to bet if we took a whole bunch of people and, you know, that were just completely foreign to drawing, you know, when they were quite young, and we were to see like the way they were drawing things, you'd probably be able to find out, you know, working memory differences, fluid intelligence differences, all sorts of different things, because that's very direct window, literally, into the way you're perceiving things with very little training. So it's gonna, I, I think there's something there to take a look at. Um, and then the other thing would be, um, not, not only that, but when you're drawing something, like even if you have a good picture of it in your head or an idea of what you want, you're trying to trick your brain into thinking that's what it is in front of you, a representation, right? So what, what do you, you know, if you've, if you've looked at a little, you know, a, a kid's drawing who's never drawn before and you look at it, some people would say that's modern and abstract art because it is. There's so many different ways to interpret it if you don't have that original reference material to constrain that. Like, it could be so many different things and there's a level of elegance and beauty to that, actually. I think we need to start rephrasing the way that we talk about um, all of these different fields of science or, or the arts, they're, they're all really ways of making sense and modeling the world and, and you know, and, and their own unique perspective. Um, and each of those perspectives uh, are, are very, you know, they can very well be useful and purposeful for a certain task. I mean, you can have some of the smartest people in the room in terms of traditional fluid intelligence scores or something. But, you know, getting the perspective of somebody else and perspective is defined by they're not seeing what you're seeing they're seeing something different and then when they're brought together and they intersect they may reveal some other underlying pattern or sameness and difference thing if you remember right um which could end up being very powerful um and that that's why like also like when you when you create things what are you doing you're taking two different perspectives right of something and then you're combining them in a way that they weren't combined before in other words you're intersecting them you're finding the sameness and then difference and that usually reveals something interesting. Uh, and that can also be thought of as compression or abstraction, right? So yeah, I just thought this would be kind of interesting to ramble on about for a little bit. Um, you know, I've been interested in, in the visual, all arts, but in particular the visual arts for a long time now, for basically the entirety of my life. And that's because I noticed like, you know, a really good photo or a really good uh, painting or drawing or, or, or whatever, or sculpture, will make you feel a certain way. In other words, it will drive your behavior, your agency. It'll direct your agency in a certain way. Um, and usually we think of these these more strictly physicalist, uh, kind of brute force ways of, of guiding behavior and doing things. But that's, in a sense, your perception is a type of illusion. It's like a controlled illusion. And that you're, it's this sort of mutual agreement between the thing that you're looking at and the thing that's looking at it. So the observer and the observed. And in a sense, information itself doesn't exist until it is observed and perceived and constrained in a certain way, right? So if you think about, you know, the, the idea of an optical illusion, like a, like a Necker cube, for instance, right? Like the, the cube that can be looked at in different ways. That's technically put on a 2D medium, but your brain is deriving something three-dimensional or higher from that. And not only that, but there's all these different ways that are interfering with each other in perspectives. And it's like, 
that, that's a really good example of this idea of informational ambiguity, that you can look at something and there are technically truly many different correct ways of looking at it, but it depends on what you're trying to get out of it. And this also ties back into that idea that if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And you know, actually, while I'm, while I'm on this note, maybe I'll, I'll also talk about uh, a little anecdote about skateboarding. I'm, I'm pretty interested in skateboarding for a lot of reasons, but one of them uh, is because of the divergent thinking that's required to be a really good skater. And good skater, not just, you know, in terms of, you know, traditional technical skills of getting the trick done, but also the way you're perceiving the world and finding the things that other people wouldn't think of as obstacles or things to skate on. And not only that, but skating on them in a very different way. Like the person that comes to mind for me is Andy Anderson, like almost always. Like that guy is just so incredibly creative when it comes to skating. It's, it's beautiful to see. Um, but you know, if you have a skateboard from the perspective of the skateboard as the agent and it's going along in this environment, right? It's, it's you know, to, to the, from the perspective of the skateboard, the streets and the rails and the stairs are kind of its reality, its perceptual window. And if you look at that, you'll notice that, um, yeah, there's only so many different ways that skateboard is gonna be able to actually traverse this, this environment and compress things and make sense of them, right? And so, yeah, like that, that's, that's just kind of an interesting example of, you know, if, if you're riding on a skateboard, you know, how many ways you're gonna go down the stairs? How, if there's something in front of you, how many ways are you gonna go around it? If you can't go, you know, around it on the side, you go over it, right? And then you do something called an ollie or a kickflip or whatever. Uh, I'm, maybe I'll, I'm rambling a bit now and I'll, I'll jump into this in more detail in a future episode, but um, yeah, just, just a quick summation, I would say, you know, the visual arts are a good example, uh, you know, that, that, that all these fields are cognitive sciences because there are ways that information is created and, and measured in a sense. It's differentiated, right? It's this idea of the observer and the observed. Um, the thing itself is not, you know, information until it's observed, until you can actually say what it is or, or it isn't, right? Um, and I'll give one last example where it's like, let's say there's letters and words on your screen right now. That's trying to trick your brain that those words and letters are there and that language is there, right? If you remember from the, I think the first episode I did on this, like, that's technically not there. You can have somebody else, in the case of English, that's trained on that, you know, and it could, you could, they could be saying the same things audibly, it could, the letters are the same visually, but the meaning and the internal compression of that could be something completely different. And you can even try training on this yourself if you want to try it out, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's this sort of mutual thing between the, the information and the observer about what it's about constraining what you're supposed to be looking at. Um, I don't know, I just thought that was kind of interesting to, to ramble on about for a little bit.